So how do I get to a diagnosis? A very, very good history is going to be key here. And I don't want you to roll your eyes at me, but this is really an important relationship between patient and doctor. It is not solely on me to ask the right questions. It is also on you to know your body and your history and give me the right answers. I can only work with the information you're giving me. This means if you have infertility and you're going to see your doctor, it is so crucial that you think about how your body feels, what is going on, and especially any changes that might be occurring which are different from baseline. Meaning, I used to feel this way, but now I feel this way. That's really important data. I go through menstrual cycle at length with my patients, looking for subtle changes. I go through chronic inflammatory symptoms. I talk about any signs and symptoms of endometriosis or adenomyosis. I go through risks that could be impacting our egg quality or sperm quality. We talk about family history. We're really trying to dig into where there might be things that could be contributing to this picture, even if we are not able to get to a diagnosis. Let's talk about sometimes the ones that we can. So egg quality, sperm quality, we often can't get to a diagnosis. Those are some that there might be risk factors for, or essentially how I approach it to my patients, you're gonna make the changes to accommodate those because we can't test them, we have to assume something's wrong. So we're gonna start making changes on those fronts. When it comes to chronic inflammation or to lifestyle, this is a big one that honestly, we often have to assume something's wrong until proven otherwise. Sometimes we can find the answer and sometimes we cannot, but let me take you through my approach. Endometriosis might be diagnosed in 30 to 50% of patients with unexplained infertility. That should tell you just how big a player endo is, how undiagnosed it is, and how this overlap with inflammation and unexplained infertility, how tight they are. Endometriosis is when your body has an abnormal reaction to essentially a normal process. Physiologically, what happens is you get implants of endometrial tissue outside the uterus. The endometrium is the inner lining of the uterine cavity. This is what grows every month in response to estrogen. This is what sheds every month when you have your period. Well, these endometrial implants get outside the uterine cavity in a variety of different mechanisms, to be honest, but the simplest one to explain is to think about the fact that in everybody, some endometrial cells will go out your fallopian tubes when you're on your period, and that's perfectly normal. If we go and do surgery and you're on your period, we can actually see some menstrual blood in your abdominal cavity. That's not the problem. The problem really here is on an immune level. Your body sees this and says, oh my gosh, something's wrong. There's endometrium in here attack, attack, not recognizing that these are your normal cells. The real problem here with endo is you get these high pockets of inflammation. Your body's immune system is constantly activated. Chronic inflammation goes up because we are now trying to combat this abnormal finding. Inflammation is a piece of the puzzle to endo, not just anatomic changes. But yes, Inflammation over time can lead to chronic scar. And endo can be devastating. You can see a complete destruction of normal pelvic anatomy. In stages, you can get cysts in the ovaries. You can have the fallopian tubes completely destroyed. But that doesn't mean that if you don't have those anatomical changes, that you don't have endo impacting your fertility. I will actually have patients say, oh, I don't have endo that bad, so it's not a big deal. It's always a big deal. And we always need to think about it in our treatment strategy. But why is endo so underdiagnosed and hard to diagnose? It's because currently it's a surgical diagnosis only, meaning I have to put a camera in your belly button, look around at your abdomen to know if you have endo or not. That's the only way to truly say you do not have endometriosis. We don't always do that. And that can feel really frustrating because I know we want an answer, but sometimes we're working on our primary goal. There's reasons why surgery might make sense. It might be based on your symptomology or your goals at the moment. But if our goal is to try to get pregnant as fast as possible, which is often the case for my patients, sometimes we actually don't go through the surgical road. We actually consider, do you have high risk for this? Are we gonna have a presumed endometriosis diagnosis? Are we gonna make any changes based on this or not? Because sometimes I just treat you in case you have it, depending on the full picture. This is different if you're not trying to conceive and you trying to conceive. It is true though, at least for the first surgery for endometriosis, if you do have endometriosis and the lesions are excised, your inflammatory levels are going to go down and you are gonna see an improvement in fertility levels, but it is transient and repeat surgeries do not show that same benefit. So that doesn't mean that you don't have that done, but it's a careful discussion of when it makes sense for you if you're going to get that done and the risks of surgery because no surgery is without risk. 
Well, sometimes you can get an endometriosis diagnosis without going through surgery. This is classically if we see signs of endo on ultrasound. And I always tell patients, not seeing endo on ultrasound doesn't mean you don't have it, but seeing it can make me feel confident that you do. Specifically, we can see cysts in the ovaries, which are called endometriomas. This is where endometriosis actually got into that follicle when it ruptured, and then it became an endometriosis cyst. And these are highly devastating. They damage your ovary. They damage your anatomy. They decrease your ovarian reserve. This is why patients with infertility actually have lower ovarian reserve and go into menopause earlier. This is why patients with endometriosis actually have lower ovarian reserve and go into menopause earlier. So endo can be very devastating on multiple layers. So sometimes we see where uterine scarring, we see implants on ultrasound, or we see cysts. That sometimes can make us feel convinced you have endo. Also, history is really important. So with endometriosis, you are classically going to have very painful periods. Not necessarily heavy periods, but painful periods. And when it comes to pain, you might have pain with intercourse or GI changes as well. Just think about all that peritoneal inflammation is going to irritate your intestines and can cause diarrhea, constipation, bloating, gas, and just GI upset, especially around your period. Now, pain is very subjective and it's very hard to diagnose. And what I find is women are exceedingly tough. Women come in my office and they say, my period pain is not that bad. And so what I always ask is, how were your periods when you were younger? Because when we were a teen, we didn't know any different. And so if you were in school and you would go home when you were on your period or beg your mom to keep you home, if you would not go to Pizza Hut with your friends or miss out on the football game, those are really high indicators and they have a high what's called positive predictive value that you do in fact have endometriosis. And what typically happens is we become accustomed, right? You change and you adapt to your environment. And if that becomes normal for you, you just assume that everybody else tolerates it better than you. And unfortunately, that's what women tell me all the time. Oh, I just have low pain tolerance when in fact you actually have an exceedingly high pain tolerance because you are dealing with that pain over and over. Another big clue or warning sign is if you have pain with intercourse in certain positions, especially those in deep penetration, you prefer not to have intercourse in some of those, that can be a sign of endometriosis because of where these implants more likely are, or if your pain significantly improved on birth control pills. So sometimes this is the case that you were fine for 10 or 15 years because you were on the pill, but now it's starting to come back and get worse. These are red flags to me that I'm thinking about endometriosis, and I might give you a presumed endo diagnosis, even if I'm not putting you through surgery to get it. Adenomyosis is very similar. It's endometriosis's cousin. But instead of going out the fallopian tubes or being outside the uterus in general, those endometrial implants are actually in the myometrium or the muscular component of the uterus. Remember the uterus is in three layers. So you have the serosa, the outside slimy, shiny area of the uterus. The bulk of the uterus is muscle. That's called the myometrium. And then you have the inside of the uterus, which we already talked about is the endometrium. So if you get endometrial implants that are highly inflammatory in the myometrium, that's called adenomyosis. Now, this is classically not seen unless something has been in the myometrium, notably a placenta. Adenomyosis is one of those things that's definitely on the list for secondary infertility. So is endo because the more ovulatory cycles you have, the worse these things are going to get. But for adenomyosis specifically, we really wanna have a pathway for that endometrium to get myometrial. This also could be though from uterine surgery in the past, having fibroids removed, having any type of uterine scarring or incision. I've seen it a couple times from really terrible IUD placements or a migrating IUD, but most of the time, this is from having a placenta grow into your uterus, and then the cavity that's kind of left behind afterward before it is fully healed, you get this immune response to the endometrial tissue that migrates into the myometrium. And it causes a lot of local inflammation in the uterus. This actually can cause painful and heavy periods. So it's a little bit different, whereas the heaviness and the amount of blood tends to change. Neither of these classically cause spotting or irregularity to your cycle. That doesn't mean those can't exist because you can always have two things going on, but adenomyosis is classically this bulkier uterus. The keyword we always use is boggy, meaning if I do a bimanual exam, if I'm feeling your uterus with my hands, it feels soft and squishy instead of firm. 
but it's because that myometrium, that muscle component is now invaded. So it doesn't have the same structure that it used to, but this local inflammation can really impact how your body allows a pregnancy to implant. This one can often be diagnosed on ultrasound or MRI. So at least it's an easier diagnosis. It's not surgery only, but unlike endometriosis where you can see some benefit to surgery, I do not recommend surgery with adenomyosis the vast majority of the time because it tends to destroy your uterus and really holds a lot of risk. And I've seen patients who go have extensive adenomyosis resections and then their uterine cavity is scarred and destroyed and they have very difficult time conceiving. We'll say, if you're not looking to get pregnant again, that's a different discussion. But if you're still trying to conceive, I don't love surgery as an approach for adenomyosis because that myometrial layer is so important. And this is a place where we wanna suppress that tissue. And really we have to strongly consider IVF because of some of the hormonal changes that I'm gonna go over. Lastly, before I talk about treatment approaches, is we have to think about chronic endometritis and what that is. And it's gotten a lot of buzz and attention lately because people talking about the vaginal microbiome or the uterine microbiome. And we have to remember, there's been a study looking at gut microbiome and vaginal microbiome. And in fertile versus infertile people, we saw an abnormality in gut microbiome and not in the vaginal microbiome, meaning your gut microbiome is very important for your overall level of inflammation and having an abnormal gut health is a greater risk for infertility than having abnormal vaginal microbiome. That's not looking at the uterine microbiome. And to be honest, even though there's tests for this, we don't have good data on what to recommend. However, we do know that chronic endometritis is a chronic inflammation of the endometrium. And it is a real thing that can contribute sometimes to spotting, abnormal bleeding, some instability in the endometrium, and to infertility or pregnancy loss. That doesn't mean we need to go down this pathway of endometrial biopsy and isolating certain cells, but that treating it can be advantageous. And treatment has proven to be two weeks of antibiotic therapy has been helpful and proven with chronic endometritis. 